Hello and welcome to my extended review of Delta Wedding by Eudora Welty. This is the Harcourt Brace Jovanovich version. And looks like 1974 is the latest copyright of this book. So the page numbers that, uh, for the quotes that I'll be reading are gonna be taken from this edition. And this edition that tallies up to 247 pages altogether. It's my first Eudora Welty. And although I'm very familiar with Southern literature in general, my senior thesis in undergrad was on William Faulkner. I've had a chance to visit his home. I've also had a chance to visit Flannery O'Connor's home and I've read her work. I, I had known about Eudora Welty and she's been on my radar for a long time, but I have to confess, I had not had a chance to read her work. And I'm both glad that I had a chance to read this, this work, but also sad that I did not come to it sooner. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. The novel itself is a challenging one, I think, in a number of ways, but it's just very beautiful in its language. I can't get into everything in just a short YouTube review, but what I can do is talk about some of the reasons why I think you should read this novel. So I think, firstly, if you're interested in understanding a little bit more about Southern literature in the United States, this book is... I would say picture perfect for that. It doesn't have the intimidation factor of a William Faulkner or perhaps the reputation factor. Flannery O'Connor has reputation has grown very much in the past few years and so people come with their own set of expectations. Eudora Welty is not frankly as well known um, for, for the casual reader who, who's interested in the in Southern literature in the United States. She is well known for those people who do love Southern literature but the, the way that the text comes to the reader, I think, is both immersive and languorous. In that, in that sense of what the South, uh, you, whether antebellum South or even the South of the, the 1920s, which is what this is, this is capturing, it's just a, a world in which time almost stands still. There's no, there's no rush. There's no agenda. There's no, in fact, there's one state with one part of the, the text in which the characters forget that it's Sunday because they don't know what day of the week it is. They are caught up in the wedding. So premise of the book, there is a wedding that's happening in the Delta, part of Mississippi. And the entire action of the novel is focused on that, but not in the way that you'd think that there is a a lot of story, a lot of different characters that are involved in different incidents going up to the wedding. It's just a, a snapshot of here's a week um, leading up to this wedding and what what is life in this Southern family like? And it focuses on the Fairchild family. They're probably former slave owners. They, they're still on a plantation. They managed to preserve their wealth and still, frankly, preserve uh, what would have been their slaves but that are, are now either sharecroppers or paid servants. And as you, you can see by the language that they use and the attitudes that they have, that they are unapologetically still tied to that antebellum South. And you could easily go back, I'd say 40 or 50 or 60 years, and that language would have still been the same. The way that they interacted with the the black people in the novel still very much how a planter would have interacted with, with slaves. And you wouldn't, for those people who are looking for a very plot driven story, you're not going to find it in Delta Wedding. Delta Wedding is, is a, as I said, languorous look at the South in general, the South of the 1920s in particular, and then if you want to get even more fine-grained and specific, the South of the Mississippi Delta, and in particular of this one family, the Fairchilds. And every family is particular in its own way, so I don't know that the Fairchilds could be considered a typical Southern family, but there are aspects of them that are very, that are very Southern, including having a bunch of male relatives killed in what is often called the late unpleasantness or the, the war between the states. And they have their own peculiarities insofar as 
the women manage to have great personalities and characters, but they're entirely tied up with the... I wouldn't... Would I use the word worship? Let's say service. So the service of the men in the family is the most important thing. And we see it culminating with our character, Laura, as a nine-year-old girl whose mother is was part of this family. So she's a cousin. And her mother died recently. And you think as the story starts that this is going to be her story. And it is in part, it's really a story of the Fairchilds. She's part of that clan. And so she shares in that story. But we keep shifting between different characters. Ellen, who is the the wife of of battle fairchild who's where where the wedding is being hosted dabney is her daughter it's dabney's wedding that we're going to be witnessing and laura bookends she she's the last thing that we see in the novel and she's the the first thing that we we run into as well but realistically it's not just her story but i do think that in a particular way this this desire to please the men in the family is most clearly seen in in Laura's desire to to please her uncle George. So George is a brother of Battle Fairchild and in 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 the story his wife Robbie who's always been very headstrong has run off has tried to run off and they they live in memphis and he's come down to the wedding to get ready for the wedding and he doesn't seem that concerned about running after his wife i think partially he suspects that his wife might come back but the women in the family really just orbit around george and do his bidding is a bit strong, but they accommodate him. He's the center of their universe. And by the end, what we see is that Laura, at nine years old, has instinctively been pulled into this as well. She is someone who wants to please George as well. And she's managed to... She's managed to do this so entirely and completely. So she wants to give a gift to George and what she ends up doing. And again, the way that a nine-year-old thinks, I think Eudora Welty captures this so well. She, she takes one of his pipes, hides it, and then gives it back to him as a gift. And it's, it's about a page, but I'm going to read it to you, the whole, the whole passage, because I think it's just a wonderful passage. So this is on page 208, 209 of the HBJ version. When the clock struck for seven, Laura in the flower girl dress brought the pipe out of the hat and stood in the decorated hall with it until she saw George come through there. She followed him and confronted him at the water cooler on the back porch. Lizards were frolicking and scratching on the wire outside, being gazed at from inside by the old cat Beverly. Nobody else was around. Bringing it slowly from behind her sash, she gave the pipe to him very slowly, inching it out to him to make the giving longer. At first he did not seem even to understand that he could take it, for she was so ceremonious. I wanted to give you a present you really wanted to get, so I kept it away from you a while, explained Laura. He bent his handsome head. He listened to her closely. That was the way Uncle George always listened as if everyone might tell him something like this. I wanted to surprise you, she said. Yes, honey. He kissed her right between the eyes. He took the pipe. Thank you, he said. You're growing up to be a real little fair child before you know it. She was filled with happiness. Is there any other thing I could give you after this for a present? She asked finally. Instead of saying no, he said gently, thanks. I'll let you know, Laura. More happiness struck her like a shower of rain. She looked at him dazzled. Tonight? It might be later, he said. He pulled her hair a little then, her curls. While she waited shyly, he put the pipe in his mouth, lighted it, puffed out a strong cloud, and nodded his head at her to show her that 
pipe was nice to get back. Then they both had a drink of water out of the spigot, he drinking from the tarnishy cup, she from the ridgy glass. I mean, wow. <laughs> it's just such a wonderful moment. And I think, in a sense, captures the entire novel for me because you have this relationship of one of the Fairchild women to George. You have the innocence of youth. You have these little moments they talk about lizards frolicking the old cat beverly they they took a drink of water from the tarnishy cup and from the ridgy glass so that passage that i read should give you some perspective into the wonderful writing that you're going to see throughout the text and if you need any more evidence i'm going to give you a bit more taking a few lines from different pages that i wanted you to hear so this is from page 11 Laura put her head on Aunt Ellen's shoulder and sank her teeth in the thick Irish lace on the collar of her white voile dress, which smelled like sweet peas. So descriptive. Page 30. Above in an unbroken circle, all around the wheel of the level world, lay silvery blue clouds whose edges melted and changed the, into the pink and blue of sky. Page 42. It is because people are mostly layers of violence and tenderness, wrapped like bulbs, she thought soberly. I don't know what makes them onions or hyacinths. I mean, uh, it's just amazing. Now this relates to a central theme of the novel, the fact that violence can live side by side with love. And we could say great violence and great love. And it's related to a story that go, that goes throughout the, the whole novel and descriptively it's a train. So if you can imagine this train going throughout this whole novel, but there's an incident that happens at a train trestle where one of the children who's mentally handicapped is somewhat caught on the trestle and George goes to rescue her. The train ends up stopping for them. It's sort of a typical small town move. And this causes problems with Robbie, who's George's wife, and, and also Dabney ends up getting proposed to just shortly after this, this incident. So it's an it's a incident that ties together the whole novel from start to finish. But I'll, I'll, get, I'll get back to this theme in a moment. I want to keep reading some of these, these beautiful bits of language from Welty. This is on page 49. Does happiness seek out, go to visit? the ones it can humble when it comes at last to show itself? If I'm not offering commentary, it's because I suppose I'm a bit at a loss for words. It's just beautiful to meditate on some of these things. Much later in her, this is on page 89. Much later in her room, Dabney opened her eyes. Perhaps she had only just gone to sleep, but the silver night woke her the night so deep advanced toward day that she seemed to breathe in a well drenched with the whiteness of an hour that astonished her. I'm not just gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna read just a couple more and then, and then I'll leave it. I'll, I'll go a little further into the book. As they went down the Yazoo, which is a river, a long, this is on page 172. As they went down the Yazoo, a long flight of ducks went over, going the way they were going, the V very high in the sky, very long and thin, like a ribbon drawn by a finger through the air. But neither child said anything, and after a long time, the ducks were a little wrinkled deep down in the sky and then out of sight. Read one more. Page 174. Taking the posts was a hedge that went up from the landing, higher than anybody's head. With tiny leaves nobody could count, boxwood. It was bitter green to smell, the strong, fearless fragrance of things nobody has been to see. Reminding me of that Keats poem of unheard melodies with Ode, Ode on a Grecian Urn. So I, I mentioned that one of the quotes I'd read talked about this idea of, of people being either onions or, or hyacinths. And 
and a central theme of the novel being the idea that love lives side by side with, with violence or, or even argument. And I'll read a few quotes that, <laughs> rather, I, I, I consider them humorous because I, I know from, from living in a family and having brothers and sisters that these are the sorts of things that you say to each other. They don't ever really mean anything like, well, you know, you'll say to a sibling, oh, I hate you, or uh, you don't really mean it in, in, in the sense that you would as a, a sober adult. So this is on page 115, and one of the fathers is saying this. Laura and Maureen said battle with the condensed roar in his fatherly voice carrying out the window. Will you obey me and come to the table before I skin you alive and shake your bones up together and throw the sack in the bayou? <laughs> I mean, it's just such a great, it's such a great and colorful threat. You know, it's just, you know, you, you somewhat wish that your parents possessed that sort of eloquence. The, one of the sisters-in-law, or rather one of the fair child women, and, uh, her husband, I suppose, would be a brother-in-law, so he's not present. This is Aunt Tempe. Nothing tired Ellen herself more than the spectacle of marital bullying, but it was the breath of life to Tempe, spectacle and all. So she enjoyed getting into fights with her husband. It was part of a happy marriage. This is a, just a, a woman from the town who knows that Robbie has run away from George. Do you mean to say, Robbie Reed, you had gone off and left George Fairchild and now you're just coming back? Said Miss Thracia. I know what he ought to do to you. <sighs> On 157. When Ellen was nine years old in Mitcham Corners, Virginia, her mother had run away to England with a man and stayed three years before she came back. She took up her old life and everything in the household went on as before. Like an act of God, passion went unexplained and undenied, just a phenomenon. You make this mistake, you come back, you resume your life. You don't pretend it didn't happen, but you don't make a big deal about it. Page 187. Uh, doesn't that sound like his brother Dennis's very words and voice? He's speaking about George, cried Tempe, passing by with her little silver dish. He would murder me if I contradicted him, and he loved me better than anybody in the world. <laughs> my brother my brother would kill me if I contradicted him, but he really loved me. One of the cousins is drawing a picture of one of his other cousins. What is the picture of Roy? Asked India in practical tones. Lady Claire being hanged by the pirates. That's her tongue sticking out. <laughs> one, of her, one, of her, one of his cousins being murdered and he's painting it in watercolor. Again, children in their innocent way aren't, aren't contemplating the realities of these situations. Last one here on page 230. Bluett is the youngest child, probably four, five, six. Lie back down, Bluett, yelled her father from his bed. <laughs> Go back to sleep or I'm coming to break your neck. <laughs> um, it, it, it's, 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 it's true that, that I'm not trying to laugh about violence. Violence is violence. But the casual <laughs> explanations of violence here in what is very clearly a, a love-filled family. There is so much love in this household. It, it radiates outwards into the entire community. That, in, in a sense, it's that love that allows you to say such crazy things. Like, uh, you know, my, my brother would murder me if I contradicted him. And he loved me more than anybody. And it reminds me of... of a quote which I consider central to understanding this text. Page 164, not quite the middle of the book. Robbie, who's George's wife, says, My sister Rebel is right. You're either born spoiled in the world or you're born not spoiled. 
and people keep you that way until you die. The people you love keep you the way you are. And we've heard this spoken about in a lot of personal development books in recent years. You are the average of the five closest people to you. But that idea is very much in the sense of choosing your friends. You can pick your friends, you can't pick your family. And the people you love keep you the way you are. It's very hard to escape the influences of your childhood, of your siblings, of your family, for better or for worse. And I think that the quote is a truism and it's something that ties the entire book together. The people you love keep you the way you are. There's a lot more I could talk about that I would normally talk about in a book club discussion, which if you're interested in discussing books like this, I'll drop a link to my Patreon in the description below, as well as a link to buy a copy of Delta Wedding if you're interested in, in getting into this wonderful text yourself. Um, as I say, there's a lot of different things that I, I could discuss. There's a a portrait here of a, of, of a southern meal, which, which got me hungry. Then Roxy, who's one of the servants, was, was clearing off. They had been eating chicken and ham and dressing and gravy and good black snap beans, greens, butter beans, okra, corn on the cob, all kinds of relish and watermelon rind preserves and that good bread. Their plates were loaded with corn cobs and little piles of bones and their glasses drained down to blackened leaves of mint and the silver bread baskets lined with crumbs. <laughs> it's a Southern feast and I, I love all of that food. And you just get a snapshot there of what that life is like and the implications behind preparing all of that food as well. There's also a dark side to this that there is a character here that gets killed in part I think to illustrate the fact that if you don't have family ties in the Delta, it's dangerous for you. This is on page 221. And again, we're talking about this train track that runs throughout the whole novel, metaphorically, not, not actually. It was inevitable that George with, his, with this mind should stand on the trestle, on the track where people could indeed be killed, thrown with their beauty disfigured before strangers into the blackberry bushes. And the way that this is introduced is fantastic, that the photographer is trying to get everybody to, to smile for this picture, but in this time of photography, you need to stand still for a set amount of time and, and someone in the family moves and the photographer says, you know, don't move. And somehow he relates the story that this girl was hit by a train that he was on and instantly Ellen connects it that it was this girl that she'd seen earlier in the novel and that because she was a stranger she was killed but George helped Marine not get killed earlier on and so you have that connection that if you have family around you're going to be safe and if you're a stranger you're going to be killed and and further unfortunately this girl's exploited and you can see that in the text so I'm not going to spoil everything for you hopefully I'm not spoiling the text hopefully I'm I'm giving you some reasons to, to read into it. As I say, there's there's so much I could talk about and I would really be more interested, especially in a book discussion, a book club discussion as to what other people thought about so that I'm not just reading all of my notes and considerations. So I, if you see me looking over here, it's I'm looking at pages and pages of notes and rather than just read reading all of the notes to you, I'm just picking a few things that, that I decided I wanna speak about today. The Delta is also a character of sorts. Uh, characters say will refer to what what would the Delta what would the Delta think about things or how the Delta interacts. This is on page one forty five. In the Delta, the land belonged to the women. They only let the men have it, and sometimes they tried to take it back and give it to someone else. Also on two forty three. Oh. Vegetables, they all cried out together. What would the Delta think? Tempe demanded. <laughs> we also have two different sisters, Dabney, who's getting married, who's younger than Shelley. Which, again, the idea which we'll see in novels like Pride and Prejudice that the logic is the older sister should get married first, but that doesn't always work out. 
And as Elizabeth put, <laughs> Bennett points out, it would be very hard on the younger sisters if they couldn't come out just because the older sisters hadn't married yet. So we get insights and a wonderful narrative choice by Welty is that we get a diary entry of Shelley, who's the older sister, and I, I just find it masterful. And I, I, I'm actually not going to read it just because I don't want this review to be too, too long. I'm going to give you a few final random things that I really enjoyed. Just things that, in a sense, don't fit into any larger conversation about family, love, relationships, the Delta. Page 182. This is Ellen talking about uh, her set of keys. Mama, they're the heaviest and most keys in the world. I know it. Some of them are the things I'll never be able to think of or never will see again, said Ellen. There are all these things in the house and she has keys to some rooms and some things that she'll never use, never see again. I think that's wonderful. I love the name of Shelley's cat. Her old cat, Beverly of Graustark, came in. He had been hunting. He brought in a mole and laid it at her feet. <laughs> what a what a noble and elegant name for a cat, Beverly of Graustark. <laughs> Another page one ninety three, and this this illustrates to you the immersive language of the novel that Welty Welty just it's not stream of consciousness, but I would say it's it's immersive. You're 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 not just staying with one character or one part of the house or one smell or one sight. Everything is coming to you at once. Dabney at the moment cutting a lemon for the aunt's tea brought the tears to Shelley's eyes. Could the lemon feel the knife? Perhaps it suffered, not that vague vegetable pain lost in the generality of the pain of the world, but the pain of the very moment. Yet in the room, no one said stop. They all lay back in flower chairs and ate busily, and with a greedy delight anticipated what was ahead for Dabney. All except Shelley, who stared at George as he held the cake plate before her. She realized he was looking at her inquiringly. Aren't you famished? It occurred to her that he suffered no grievance against the hiding and protesting that went on, the secrecy of life. What was dark and what shone fair, neither would stop him. Look at all the ground we've covered in ten lines. Does a lemon feel a knife? No one considering that. Everyone sitting and eating. George holding a cake plate before her. George not holding anything against the secrecy of life. I mean, it's, uh, it's really something. And after everything, it's called Delta Wedding. The wedding is... Mr. Rondo married Dabney and Troy. It's very simple. It's just a fact of life. So I won't say anything else. I feel I've certainly spent enough time talking about how much I enjoyed this read, how strongly I would recommend it to you. And I hope that I haven't spoiled the wedding. In a sense, you know that there's going to be a wedding. And as I started this review, I'm going to tell you at the end, it's languorous. It's, it's not a page turner in the, in the way that a lot of novels these days are primed to be. It's, it's specifically a product of its age and of Southern literature in which you're not rushing through. You're not trying to find out what happens to the character. You're just enjoying your time. And in, in that sense, I think it so well executes one of the roles of Southern literature, which is to place you in the South and get you to experience what it is precisely it was to live was and potentially is but i would say more was to live in that time period and in that region of the united states a very special and peculiar in in both positive and, and negative ways delta wedding eudora welty if you'd like to see more of my book reviews you can see them here on um, my youtube channel otherwise if you'd like to participate in book discussions you can do so on my patreon and again links to the book and the patreon group will be in the description Thanks for listening.